Hi everyone, so welcome to this today's session. We have a very eminent lawyer who will be speaking on the topic which is very essential which is about contracts. So let us just quickly get started. So please keep your questions ready so that as soon as the uh, short session is over so we can quickly ask whatever questions we have related to contracts. Let us get started. Hi Nit Nishant. Hi. Hi, good morning everybody. Uh, Thanks for the introduction. I'm just uh, add a line to that. Uh, I'm actually a practicing advocate, so I'll be able to. I wanted to give you a much uh, more detailed sort of uh, in depth analysis on contracts, but that would have taken at least three days. So, <laughs> so I thought that uh, to keep it brief, I would uh, try to try my best to give you as much as possible on contracts and then subsequently on legal documentation, which probably startups require uh, on a general basis. Uh, of course, we can go into details in, on, on uh, either of those topics, but uh, I don't think we have the time right now. So uh, to start with, I'll just uh, first share the presentation. Now, if I want to share this, what do I say? So uh, let's first get into contracts. So what is a contract? Uh, basically, under the it's governed by the Indian Contract Act. Firstly, can can you all hear me properly? And am, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. So it's governed by the Indian Contract Act. The the contracts in this country. That is the uh, uh, basic law governing agreements and contracts. Now, I've given you what, how it is defined under the Contract Act, but basically what we need to understand is that somebody, one person proposes a certain terms, term and condition to enter into an arrangement with another person. The other person has to accept those terms and conditions as it is. And such, such arrangement is based upon a consideration which will be exchanged between those two parties. Basically, so what you need to understand is that there are three ingredients to, to a contract, which is a proposal, offer, the other person accepting, and the third main ingredient being consideration. Now, consideration, obviously, what we usually understand with consideration is that it has to be monetary, but sometimes it cannot be. It, it, doesn't mandate uh, necessarily have to be monetary. It can also be some uh, some act that you might do in order to complete that entire arrangement or tra or transaction. And in in fact, when we'll come down to consideration, I, I will tell you how, and I'll give you an example of that that kind of consideration also. So what we need to understand is that three basic features of a contract. Proposal, acceptance, and consideration. Even if one of them is missing, the contract is not complete. The agreement is not complete. So when we actually talk about proposal and offer, then uh, we, we are, we're looking at a, a distinct set of terms and conditions. Probably, let's say one of you actually goes on to, uh, uh, goes to a vendor and says that I have I have three products which I wish to sell at such and such price and there is no negotiation. That is your set terms and conditions. 
subsequently the vendor accepts those products the way they are and also the price that you offered that is a clear acceptance from his side and the price that he is paying is actually the consideration so i hope i've clarified that for you uh, we'll just go ahead and we'll discuss each of these in more detail and probably you'll you'll uh, you'll you'll it'll help you understand better now who can contract under the indian law uh, there are three four qualifications uh, can you all see the presentation also yeah okay so every person who is competent to contract should have attained the age of majority which is 18 years under the indian law uh, he should be a major be of sound mind if there is uh, if there is a person who is a lunatic or un of an unstable mind and has been proved such then that contract does not hold good the contract actually goes out of the window it's it's not cannot be enforced under law and is not disqualified under law to contract let's say he is a proclaimed offender and he is probably uh, an uh, outlaw and he is barred by the law to actually be even out of prison let alone enter into a contract if such a person enters into a contract that contract will not be valid so again these are three criteria of people and persons who can actually enter into a contract now you you may ask where where does a company or a corporation fit now company and corporations are separate legal entities they don't have uh, any criteria with regard to majority obviously because uh, there's there's no aspect of a uh, company having a tin majority then again there is uh, no aspect of a company being of a sound mind obviously a company uh, the the background to a company is its directors who are actually running the company so the director should have been uh, should have attained majority the director should be of sound mind and should not have been disqualified under law to contract because when a company contracts it is through its directors so therefore the company itself can contract but can contract only through its directors so the director should actually hold these three criteria in their favor to be able to contract on behalf of a company i hope i've clarified in case you have any questions you can probably note them down and we can discuss them later once the presentation is over now coming back to the three aspects the three ingredients of a contract let's first discuss proposal <clears throat> a proposal as a as i've written there one when one person signifies to another his willingness to do or to abstain from doing anything with a view to obtaining assent of that other such act or abstinence is said to have been made as a proposal now a screen co-work approached me to conduct this uh, uh, webinar and it had its own set terms and conditions saying that we won't go beyond contract and legal documentation we have a one hour limit we'll probably do this within an hour so that was a proposal that they gave me that was an act which i had to do by accepting their proposal so therefore when one person signifies to another his willingness to do a certain thing or abstain or even not do a certain thing that means that is a proposal now a lot of you might be interested in the fact that a lot of your investors probably and i i do know that you all are startups and probably are intending to run startups a lot of people uh, will come to you with a mere intention of uh, intention to invest or a statement of intention or a letter of intent which which covers a lot of aspects that oh well we will pump in so much amount of money into your uh, startup and then subsequently you'll have to give us so many shares that will not be considered as a proposal under the indian contract act because that is just a statement of mere intent that value of investment can go up or down number 1 the number of shares that you might actually give them may go up and down so therefore that is not a set 
term and condition based upon which that proposal has been made it still has the liberty or you still has the scope of a negotiation so therefore till you are actually negotiating it is not a confirmed proposal or an offer from somebody so until it's a confirmed set terms and conditions the offer is not a confirmed offer and cannot be considered as a proposal slash offer under the indian contract now if we we move on as i said if the statement is not supposed to be binding then it is merely a statement of intention it cannot be considered as a binding offer therefore you are not bound by it if you are not bound by it it is not an offer a lot of uh, uh, people also uh, feel that uh, though we are negotiating though we are uh, uh, going up and down it it would still be an offer but yes i agree on on a certain level that it could be an offer it could be termed in the english english word terminology as an offer but in the legal sense or the legal parlance it cannot be an offer so we have to distinguish between the english sense of the word and the legal sense of the word because what we are talking about is more on the legal aspect rather than the the general common sense and the way you think an offer is made offer <coughs> should be made in such a manner that in case it is accepted then legal consequences must ensue after that now again as i gave you a uh, as i gave you an example if somebody comes and makes you an offer that i'll for example invest rupees 1 lakh in your company and take so many shares then the obvious legal consequence of you accepting that offer will be that you will become a shareholder in your company so that will be a legal consequence if you accept that offer so eventually you have to uh, understand the concept of offer in conjunction with the concept of acceptance and the legal consequence that may follow after such an accept i've given you an example probably once you uh, i've shared this presentation you can have a look at the example at a later stage uh, let's move on to the next aspect and the next ingredient uh, which is acceptance now acceptance is a very important part in a contract because we and i'll keep repeating that same example because through that same example you'll you'll be able to gain the understanding across all three ingredients of a contract now this offer has come to you where 1 lakh is coming into your company and for that probably you have to give up 100 shares of your company and the other person becomes a shareholder now you have to accept that offer for a shareholders agreement eventually to be executed and signed and then be ratified by the ROC now how do you accept you either accept it through your conduct or through a written communication that you issue to the other side saying that yes i accept but that acceptance has to be unqualified it has to be a final acceptance it cannot be oh well subject to you probably giving me another 50000 i will transfer 100 shares then that offer is not the offer that he had given that offer is not what you have accepted you have actually made a counter offer to him so therefore that is not an acceptance the acceptance would only be and would only come through in case you are actually able to accept the fact that only 1 lakh is coming into your company and for that you in lieu of the, thereof you are transferring 100 shares to this gentleman who will become a shareholder so therefore the acceptance has to be final and unqualified until unless it is final and unqualified it cannot be termed as a final acceptance now as soon as you accept the contract is complete because he the other person has offered you a certain terms and conditions to which you have unqualified acceptance and therefore that acceptance completes the contract you cannot go beyond that now 
because those terms and conditions have been accepted and you'll have to abide and comply with those terms and conditions. As I said, the assent or the acceptance may be through express words or by conduct. By conduct, I could even mean that you don't need to probably send him an email saying that, yes, I accept your uh, 1 lakh rupees in lieu of 100 shares. You could straight away send him a shareholders agreement filled up with all the details and say, I've already signed this, please sign this. So that is through your conduct, you've already accepted the terms and conditions that he had put forth before you. And therefore, a legal binding uh, contract has been executed between you and the other person. <clears throat> However, as you may see in the next point, an acceptance must be communicated to the offerer for it to conclude into a contract. Mere mental resolve or written acceptance on piece of paper and keeping it or interdepartmental acceptance or mere resolution by a company pass a resolution in your board, uh, board meeting that yes, we wish to accept this offer, but you keep it with yourself. You don't even communicate it to the other person that, that that's, that's of no use because that person has not accept, uh, gained your acceptance and therefore that contract is not coming. So that acceptance, whether by conduct or by express words, has to be communicated to the other side. <clears throat> Again, the, there's an example regarding acceptance. You can probably have a look at it later once the presentation is over. Uh, coming down to consideration. A consideration is a very uh, 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 fluid sort of concept when it comes to contract. Because as I said right in the beginning, consideration, a lot of people think that it has to be necessarily monetary. But a lot of contracts actually deal with a certain person doing a certain conduct which eventually turns into consideration for that contract. I'll give you an example. I'm sure you all have heard about WeWork. Now WeWork, Mr. Newman obviously was running WeWork happily and very, very joyfully until everything started to come crashing down. Now, what did, what did the investors say? We'll invest that kind of money, but Newman needs to step down. So there was no consideration in that sense for the investors. The investors were only investing money, but the consideration for the investors was actually Newman stepping down. So that was actually a conduct by Newman, which concluded the contract. Firstly, by him accepting that, yes, investment will come in and I will step down. The consideration for the investors was that he will step down. So therefore, no more new men, a new CEO, new, uh, new uh, management. And therefore, that is how consideration in terms of non-monetary aspects work. Again, if you read, consideration is defined as a, uh, you'll have to uh, uh, excuse me for spelling mistakes because this was done very fairly last minute. So, uh, uh, so therefore, uh, I, I'm, I'm fairly strict on my own spelling. So I feel very, very disappointed when there are spelling mistakes. But uh, so consideration is defined as a value, valuable consideration in the sense of the law it may consist either in some right, interest, profit or benefit accruing to one party or some forbearance, detriment, loss or responsibility given, suffered or undertaken by the other. So the first one is obviously, the first part when you see it's obviously the consideration in terms of monetary aspects, right, interest, profit, benefit to one party. The other one is forbearance, detriment. Detriment is what I just gave you an example for. The detriment was that Newman had to step down. So therefore that was the consideration for the investors. So loss of responsibility given, suffered or undertaken by the other. Similar examples. Now the act constituting the consideration must have been a desire of the promiser. Now who is the promiser? Promiser is the person who is actually accepting the contract. Or probably is the one who is promising that I will do a certain thing. And for that... Here is the consideration. There has to be a return element because as I said, let's go back to the first example. 
somebody is paying you 1 lakh rupees the return element of that is you you giving him 100 shares in your company so the consideration for him is those 100 shares for you it is 1 lakh rupees so that is the consideration aspect in between in in the contract Again, consideration may be of benefit or uh, to either you or to a third party. However, it has to be to the benefit of certain uh, a certain party so that the contract can be concluded. Now, uh, this is a very tricky aspect that when we go to a court of law to enforce a contract, because please understand, uh, just by entering into a contract, uh, it doesn't mean that you actually uh, uh, won the battle and you you probably on, on top of this world. Sometimes contracts also go wrong and you need to also enforce them. So once you need to enforce them and you need to go to a court of law, uh, the important aspect which the court sees obviously is the and when it comes to consideration, the consideration should be real and must be something which is valuable in the eyes of law. Again, valuable does not mean monetary. It, the valuable uh, aspect means valuable in the scheme of things or in the scenario in which the contract was entered. Because at the end of the day, uh, again, we work it was valuable for Newman to step down because otherwise the company would have gone into bankruptcy because the investment wouldn't have come in. So therefore, that is valuable consideration in terms of concluding a contract. So similarly, when you go to a court of law, you will have to show that there was valuable consideration exchanged between the parties and therefore this contract needs to be enforced. Again, uh, uh, when you propose to a girlfriend or, or a wife and love is the consideration that would not conclude a contract, that will not be a contract. So uh, that is something which has been kept out of the purview of the law and therefore those would not be contracts per se in the eyes of law. Again, uh, when we go to a court of law to enforce a contract, the adequacy of consideration is never looked into. Because what happens usually is that they just look at the three ingredients. They don't really look at the fact that whether, uh, let's say, the valuation of a company really demanded one lakh rupees investment in lieu of 100 shares or whether that one lakh uh, really should have just given you 10 shares. I mean, that is not for the, uh, the court to go into in terms of enforceability of the contract. Of course, we can go into merits and demerits of a certain transaction that is a different story altogether those are more detailed discussions however in terms of the actual acceptability or the legality of a contract the adequacy of consideration is never looked into so these were the three ingredients that probably uh, you should definitely keep in mind while actually entering into a contract these are three things which should always exist when a contract is to be entered into. Now, there are certain other aspects in under the Contracts Act, which probably would be helpful for, for you all, uh, which are obviously, one is a lawful contract. What is a lawful contract and agreement? What is a void agreement and what is a voidable agreement? Now, an agreement which is lawful, it is, is, is lawful if it can be enforced under law. Simple. I mean, if it is legally binding, if it is legally enforceable, it is a legal contract and a lawful contract. Now, the aspect of in enforceability does not pertain to a certain procedural law. Let's say you entered into a contract today and after three years, you wish to recover money under that contract. Under procedural law, you can only recover a certain amount of money within three years of you having contract. Now you're prohibited from recovering that money due to a procedural aspect. But the contract is not wrong. It is your delay that has prohibited you from recovering that money under that contract. So therefore, it will not have a, a legal invalidity to the contract. It will only say that yes, the contract cannot be enforced because of a procedural irregularity. Now what is a void agreement? 
void agreement is if it cannot be enforced under the law. A contract to supply narcotic drugs. I mean, that cannot can never be enforced under a con uh, under the contract law. In this kind of thing. A void agreement is bad in law right from the beginning. So even if you say that today I've entered into an agreement and probably the law does not does not allow that, yet the contract was bad right from the from the initiation and therefore it can never be enforced. So it is something which which can never be enforced and you can never rely upon it. So a void agreement is bad in law right from the beginning. A voidable agreement is slightly different. A voidable agreement is entered into by obtaining consent of a party through coercion, undue influence, fraud or misrepresentation. A coercion, undue influence are more like you're forced, you probably, uh, somebody has put a gun to your head or probably uh, even uh, fraud or misrepresentation where you've actually misrepresented that your the value of your company is much higher. You've got a fraudulent uh, evaluation report from a, from a CA. To, sh to show the other side that this person should invest this amount of money and for that you will probably be sharing those, those many shares with that person. Now that is a voidable agreement. In a voidable agreement, the parties whose consent has been sought through misrepresentation has the right to either continue with that agreement or avoid that agreement. Now if that party either continues or avoids that agreement, after that choice has been made by that party, that party cannot go back. So let's say again, coming back to the same example, you have a wrong valuation report, the person has invested 1 lakh rupees for just 10 shares. Now that person says, okay, I'll continue with those 10 shares. Fine. I'm happy with those 10 shares because he probably sees that the valuation will definitely go up and his 10 shares will be valuing much more in the, in the coming future. So then he can't go back and say, oh, I, today I thought that yes, 10 shares are fine. Tomorrow I don't think 10 shares are fine. So once he's acted upon that thing, he cannot go back. So avoidable agreement, yes, it is, it, it is bad in law, but once it is ratified by the party whose consent has been taken by fraud or misrepresentation, that voidable agreement can be acted upon by both parties. So that is the difference between a void agreement and a voidable agreement. I'll just give you certain examples of uh, lawful agreements, void agreements and voidable agreements. Now lawful agreements, as you know, sale deed, sale and purchase agreement, shareholders agreements, employment agreements, uh, license agreements, e-contracts, even on websites when you, when you have a certain uh, number of terms and conditions and you have a big box right in the end where you say you accept that itself is a contract between you, your website and the customer who's actually visited your website and wants to use your website through for any medium uh, whatsoever. Void agreements again contract to supply narcotic drugs, to supply we weapons to wage war against the nation, agreement and restraint of trade. Again, uh, uh, the contract act bars any such agreements where you say that you cannot uh, probably you put an embargo on cert on a person to say you cannot practice a certain trade. So uh, the constitution provides you the right to practice any trade that you want, which is lawful and legal in this country. So you cannot have an agreement in that in that against that Agre uh, agreement and restraint of legal proceedings. Again, you can't say that based upon this contract. In case there is a dispute, you will never go to a court of law. That again cannot be accepted by the law. So you always have recourse to legal proceedings. Such agreements are again void agreements. Voidable are, as, as I told you, fraudulent valuation of a company and consent is taken on that such fraudulent valuation. Misrepresenting to a purchaser of a, of a flat that the floor area is a certain floor area, but it doesn't, it actually is. So these were basically the aspects I wanted to cover under contracts. Uh, I hope you made your questions. I'd be happy to answer them right at the right at the end once we uh, move on and finish the other section. So uh, as I said right in the beginning, uh, contracts is a huge topic. Uh, it 
it uh, involves a lot of uh, detailed in-depth study and a lot of examples could be given for various aspects uh, however these were the basic things and generic things that i truly wanted you all to understand and probably uh, maybe in another session or some other day we can we can deal with other other aspects of contract now uh, coming to legal documentation for startups uh, i have uh, listed out about uh, uh, i think nine is the number uh, seven eight so uh, these are the legal documents that i feel startup should definitely have uh, and uh, which would be very important for a company to be set up and to be run in an efficient and professional manner and also for that company to eventually be able to stand in, stand on its own two feet and be able to at least pitch in the market for any further investment in case it, it wishes to do so. So uh, right in the beginning, I've divided uh, the uh, presentation on this into pre-incorporation and post-incorporation. Uh, I hope you understand pre-incorporation is before you've incorporated a company, what kind of documents you'll require for incorporation. And subsequently, once you've incorporated, what kind of documents you'll probably need for running of the company. So pre-incorporation, you'll need a memorandum of association. Uh, it is a legal document which states the purpose of the formation of the company. Basically, why are you forming this company? What kind of business you going to run? The name of the company, registered office, authorized share capital, and the liability of the shareholders who are part of the company while the company is being incorporated. Now, there are various other things also which are fairly minute and, and probably also get covered under the memorandum of association. But these are the basic sort of broader outline of uh, for which a memorandum of association is drafted uh, this is an important document because this goes to the roc while you're incorporating a company this is a, this document tells the roc uh, all the details about the company and uh, based upon this the roc acts upon uh, for incorporation of your company now, Articles of Association is another document which goes with the MOA, uh, which uh, specifies the regulations for a company's operations and defines the company's purpose. The company, uh, the document lays out how tasks are to be accomplished, including the process of appointing the directors and handling of financial records. Now, primarily a, a procedural guideline as to how the company will be run. How the directors will be appointed how a board meeting will happen how uh, how the financial records will be taken care of uh, uh, how many employees uh, in terms of shareholders and directors the company will have and all these procedural aspects of this of the, com uh, the running of the company again articles are uh, given to the roc along with the moa for incorporation now moa is uh, usually uh, uh, a public document it can be viewed by anybody articles are something which are more personal to the company because that is how the company is going to be run so therefore that can always be altered moa changing of the moa uh, needs uh, uh, needs a lot of ratification by the by the board and the company <coughs> sorry now uh, coming to the third documentation uh, which I feel is fairly important and a lot of companies tend to feel that it's uh, it or probably put it on the back burner and uh, and I put this into pre feel that IP is something which if you have it in place it goes a long way in creating the uh, goodwill and the uh, uh, the, the company itself and the and the reputation that the company has in the future uh, intellectual property uh, as as you all might understand uh, ranges from trademarks to copyrights to patents to even designs now uh, trademarks is something which is fairly important for any company 
that is the name or the trading name under which you all probably would operate and you need to register that why because that is your identity if you lose your identity and somebody else is copying that identity then you don't have any recourse in case you don't have registration in your name of course you you will have a recourse uh in terms of going to a court of law to enforce your ip but it will be a slightly weaker recourse vis a vis if you have a registration in your name now again coming to copyright a lot of you might even have uh, certain brochures or probably uh, data or something. i don't know what all you deal in but uh, there could be certain aspects of literary material which you might have created on your own which is important only to your company and if it is copied by somebody else then obviously loses its uh, newness it loses its uniqueness and therefore uh, your business will get hampered so again copyright material brochures articles uh, reading papers which you feel that are unique to your own business and if copied by anybody else would hamper your business should be uh, copyright protected uh, patents again is a fairly big uh, aspect of the startup domain because uh, i feel a lot of uh, startups in the technical area and the r and d area uh, even pharma or even the robotics area are coming up with fantastic uh, innovations and inventions which uh, definitely need to be patented unless and until you protect that through a patent uh, you will not be able to reap benefits out of that innovation that you might have created because eventually if that gets out in the public domain and somebody else is able to do it and is able to protect it through a patent then that person will have first use of right on that and then you might eventually become the infringer so what you need to understand is that ip protection even before the company has been incorporated should be definitely uh, foremost on your priority list because once you've protected your ip you you have protected the brain or the actual root of your business from where the business will actually grow so what you need to understand is even if you protect it under a person's name let's say because the company has not been incorporated the registration is taken in the person's name so the person itself can eventually who when he or she becomes a director in the company can transfer that ip to the company through a license deed or an assignment deed which is a fairly easy procedure for any individual to do to a company and obviously uh, will have its own legal consequences it will be a contract as i had as i had uh, specified in the first part of the presentation it will be a contract between the company and the individual and that ip can be transferred to the company so that that is an easy job but then again reiterating ip registration is something which definitely should be on your priority list right in the beginning even before you incorporate a company for incorporation you need a certificate of incorporation uh, it is an identity document for uh, the company it will give you a company number uh, that is how you will be uh, identified and uh, it's basically a uh, a certificate that says that you've been registered as either a public limited or a private limited company with the with the roc under the indian law now incorporation i feel these are three agreements which definitely will uh, affect the professional and efficient uh, running of your business let's come to the employment agreements right in the beginning now whenever you run a company you obviously uh, start from about let's say a startup starts from with two people and then grows into about a five six employee company and then maybe even further uh, employment agreements are essential because they form the backbone of how your employees are going to be behaving with the company how are they going to be rendering services to the company and until unless you have an efficient workforce i don't think any company can run uh, efficiently 
so for that you definitely need a detailed and a, a comprehensive employment agreement with your employees because eventually you don't want trouble from the employee end to to hamper your business growth a lot of startups i have seen and i have advised have missed out on this point because they feel that well employees come and go because startups it's a startup uh, attrition rate is very high this and that to them also i advise that see attrition rate might be very high but the fact is that you still need at least a two pager or a three three pager agreement with your employee to state that let's say even if that person has to work from home what will be his uh, time timelines of working what will be uh, his remuneration what will be in terms of his liabilities to the company and what will be the obligations that he will have to undertake towards the company a lot of people feel that oh well employment agreements are a waste of paper but i feel that actually it covers a lot when it comes to startups definitely because startups rely a whole lot on the aspect of confidentiality and the confidential aspect and how to protect that comes through an employment agreement when you're dealing with an employee because if you're not having any any agreement with an employee uh, and that employee probably knows uh, trade secrets or data or confidential information of your company and tomorrow he leaves and goes to another place you don't have anything in your hand to actually enforce that aspect of confidentiality upon him uh, through a court of law or whatever because then that person can just go and divulge any information that he had from your company and probably get paid even higher with with a competitor because he's doing such uh, such uh, he's divulging such information so again uh, employment agreements are important uh, uh, i can't uh, state as to how big or how small they should be but yes uh, they should exist in any any company or any startup now uh, the next vendors uh, i when i saw the list that uh, tanvi shared with me um, i did see a lot of uh, people uh, running startups who eventually had uh, uh, i felt a lot of dealing with uh, third party third party vendors uh, probably purchasing products or even selling products through a distributor network or a retail network now those agreements at both ends whether it is while purchasing a certain raw material or services or eventually selling those raw material or services or products to a retail or a distribution network the agreements have to be very very strong and very uh, comprehensive because you don't want to end up uh, on the losing side in terms of losing either a certain chunk of money because uh, somebody has been able to uh, outsmart you on certain terms and conditions or probably the fact that well you supplied a certain material to a certain distribution network and that distribution network uh, did not uh, uh, comply with the obligations it had to at its end and therefore the product did not reach the end consumer eventually so how do you enforce that how do you recover damages how do you uh, get into a uh, get into a situation where you are actually able to recover what you have lost so for that you need good agreements uh, of course the company needs to be cautious about exit clauses dispute resolution clauses terms and conditions obligations that you take upon yourself and pass on to the third party and eventually what kind of uh, network that you are dealing with so these are certain things which you can probably think about incorporating in the vendor agreement finally i think the most important for you all would be the shareholders agreement uh, of course uh, i i'm i'm assuming that all of you pretty much have feel that uh, one day your your startup will reach a certain point where you would like to an investor to invest in your startup and and your valuation will go up and all that again a shareholders agreement is fairly fairly important in terms of how you wish to 
uh, run your company after the investment stage because a shareholders agreement will govern uh, more than these three four things that i have listed out were fairly important uh, uh, will uh, will list out buyback options voting rights uh, exit strategies again we've uh, we've also dealt with a lot of uh, investor uh, in uh, investee disputes where uh, the investor has invested but eventually has realized that probably not worth investing or probably were not able to exit and then there's been a dispute between the investor and the company and the and the promoters and directors so uh, all these things need to be kept in mind while uh, drafting a shareholders agreement uh, again shareholders agreement uh, is pretty much a standard agreement across all pretty much all companies when you execute one but certain options where as i said buyback options voting rights dilution rights or uh, dilution of shares how that will happen and will whether it will happen at all or not is something which uh, the company the promoters directors will need to take care of again uh, whether shares will be in equity uh, or not uh, that is another aspect to be taken care of while entering into a shareholders agreement so these are certain things which you should definitely keep in mind while entering into a shareholders agreement uh, these were the basic documents what would be important for you uh, as startups uh, pre incorporation and post incorporation of course there can be a lot uh, there are a lot of other compliances compliance related documents uh, of of the top i can give you an example where you need to register under the shops and commercial establishments act uh where you need a certificate under the commercial establishment act if you don't have a shop uh then again uh, uh if you're paying salaries which are probably less than 15000 then you need pf and esi compliances uh certain uh, uh, most of you would need uh, gst probably at a later stage if you're registered under the startup regime then obviously there are other compliances to be met with then there are roc compliances once you've incorporated a company which are which are quarterly biannual annual so those are certain things which get into more details and probably are more uh, comprehensive in nature uh, though not so uh, uh, not so legally in terms of complex legally complex but uh, but yes definitely require compliance so that was it from my side uh, thank you everybody for being so patient i don't think i've ever seen a, i've ever seen anybody being so patient with me at least so thank, thank you. you so much sir it was really very insightful and valuable so we'll just shortly just start with the questions so one mm. basic question i would really uh, want to ask which will be very much relevant for everyone so when we have to execute any agreement you know for example we have to execute an nda so there we mm. have lot of uh, agreements which are available online also a lot of online templates sometimes are available and suppose we are just entering the very simple agreement so what is the process of executing the agreement like is we just take out the print out and we get the stamp papers and uh, then we sign it and then we get it notarized so is this good enough or can you just quickly just give See, us a certain certain agreements definitely need a registration uh under the registration act section 17 lists out agreements which definitely and mandatory need mandatorily need to be registered uh the others can uh, skip registration but definitely need uh, stamping so there are two aspects to executing an agreement under law one is the stamping and one is the registration stamping is basically buying adequate stamp paper for that particular agreement and reproducing that agreement on a but on that kind of stamp paper and signing the agreement along with witnesses of course and uh, just getting it notarized however let's say let's take an example of a sale deal if a company let's say one of the startups wants to invest in an asset which is a move with property then the company uh, through its director will have to enter into a sale deal sale deed will be adequately stamped and will have to be mandatorily registered with a sub registrar for it to have any uh, binding effect uh, of transfer of that immovable property from that individual to the company 
So that's how that's how it works. Okay. I hope you have answered your question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And another question that I would like to ask is just again relevant for everyone is regarding that nowadays everything is you know based by the IT Act. So like mm. documents, like even if we because right now it's a lot of hassle, you know, signing and then sending a courier to someone who's not in the city or in a country and getting mm. physical signatures and then getting it's a very long process of stamping and mm. getting a notarized. So right now it's so easy nowadays. We have a lot of online legal agreements going on. There's a lot of mm. online softwares that we can just use our online signatures. Okay. They're governed by the IT Act. Mm. So yeah, I mean, we can we can do that. We are, digital signatures are recognized under the IT Act, so uh, documents can be digitally signed. Uh, in fact, uh, I must uh, share this with you that even the trademarks registry, we filed for registration of trademarks, are done online, and I have a digital signature through which I actually file applications for uh, people, and that is uh, fairly recognized under law. So uh, digital signatures are again, as as you said very correctly, are recognized and uh, are recognized under law as well. Okay, thank you, sir. So can uh, can uh, if, let's just this is an open forum questions. Let's just all get started with the questions. Um, hi, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, earlier when you were talking about uh, contracts, you mentioned voidable contracts and the particular case where a mismatch of valuation could lead to a voidable mm. agreement. So uh, if we are following a particular model of valuation and since there are five, six models of valuation, so will getting that we are following this particular model and it is on this model that we are coming into an agreement into the contract. No, I, I understood your question. In fact, yeah. uh, uh, what I meant by fraudulent uh, valuation was that it has been attained through fraud, which okay. means that that valuation could have never been reached. Okay. And it has been it has been attained by paying off a CA for mm -hmm. that CA to sign on a document which could have never existed. Okay. So so that is how what I meant really. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Hello. Yes. Hi, Ishan. I have a question. Like, like she, like, like she has already asked. Like, we need a few documents and agreement, like NDA. So we search for different, different templates online. Mm. So, so do you have some standard templates you can provide to us? Because that is very vague based on every company to company and. From, it's from two pager to 15 pager we find online. So what if we can find a simpler one and if you want to change few things in it, based on from client to client, we can do that. See, what I would definitely suggest in that regard is that never go for templates. I know, uh, of course, uh, lawyers charge their own fee <laughs> for drafting an agreement, but uh, that is for a particular purpose because they customize that particular agreement to suit your needs and requirements. I have definitely seen, and, and I must share this with you, I do come across a lot of people who've gone through templates, who've gone through templates, got it signed, executed, subsequently landed in trouble because a certain aspect in that agreement was not, was missing and the other party has taken advantage of that and come to me saying, sir, this was the agreement, ab kya kare So. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, yes, it might uh, uh, pinch your pocket a little, but that will definitely help you to uh, cover all possibilities, all exigencies when you draft a customized agreement. Templates usually don't work. Templates only work when you're designing a, a greeting card. Please believe me. I also have one more question. Like we to, you told that we need to get NDA signed. Since most of us are startup, so many have incorporated the company and few have not yet done it and are in process of doing that. So which is better for us? Getting partnership registered, getting an LLP or a private limited? Because yeah, everybody okay. has... Pro yeah. yeah, please complete your question. Sorry. So, so which which we should go that we can do legal things and that is 
like least complex for startups because we don't want to go on to on those compliances and all those things so we want lead least complex type of startup to be registered to work on that see in my opinion uh, the least in terms of compliance would be a proprietorship uh, followed by a partnership uh, partnership again needs to be registered because uh, under section 69 of the partnership act you can neither sue or not not be sued if you're not a registered partnership or you cannot even transact business uh in terms of uh, in in a, in a legal manner if a partnership is not registered private limited again comes with its own set of compliances which are fairly uh, many fold but uh, now coming to the other aspect of whether a startup would be attractive and how attracted uh, attractive it would be if it was a private limited partnership or proprietorship and the actual uh, uh, list actually uh, flips uh, on its head because a private limited would be most attractive for any person to invest in because a person who is investing in your company will definitely look at how compliant you are with the law proprietorship does not uh, does not even want you to file anything except for your it return so just a mere it return will not help an investor get attracted to your startup to eventually invest in your company so uh, in terms of compliances yes proprietorship but in terms of attractiveness and the compliances to attract investment yes private limited so can we do something like if, if say generally uh, for a long operation say we'll be operating for next one year and investment may come or may not come so can we do something like partnership getting registered right now yes 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 in and fact i feel uh, like investment in fact i had i had uh, i had a client who had come to me who uh, was a partnership firm a uh, registered partnership firm running a startup and then eventually had uh, uh, had an investor who wanted to invest in that company in that firm and then uh, but the prerequisite was that they turn it into a private limited company so that also can be done but usually what happens is that uh, uh, turning it uh, turning the partnership firm into a private limited has its own uh, legal issues uh, which which uh, which could range from taxation issues to even a uh, change of name so uh, uh, you got to take care of that aspect also that maybe right now you might feel that it is a Uh, it is a fruitful thing to not invest so much in compliances and just run it as a partnership but eventually if it grows uh, it might have its own issues in turning or converting a partnership firm into a private limited so you might have to actually have to start up fresh uh, as a private limited uh, when you get investment okay thank you so much yeah any more questions uh hi i have a question yes so when it comes to copywriting documents for your business what all can be copyrighted uh, first is that uh, can a business idea be copyrighted no a business idea cannot be copyrighted unless uh, until it is fairly uh, innovative absolutely unique and can be written in either literary form or in any other uh, language which with where i uh, language i mean is a software language so softwares can be copyrighted even uh, uh, even literary works can be copyrighted but uh, art forms can be copyrighted but uh, business ideas per se till date a lot of people have come to me saying that i have this business idea can it be protected business ideas cannot be the concept of an idea cannot be protected only if it is transformed into something which is more tangible which is either written or uh, reproduced into a software or something then it can be uh, sought uh, protection for okay so i have a website uh, where people come and read ebooks mm. so uh, the software yeah, is in place the uh, e reader is in place the way, the way your website looks the way your website looks 
the pages it has, uh, they all can be uh, protected under the copyright law. Okay, what is the process uh, that we can follow to copyright so the we, website? We file a we file a, an application with the copyright uh, registrar of copyrights with uh, along with samples of your website pages, and uh, uh, a certain fee goes with that. We fill out the form and we file it, and uh, usually within a period of six to eight months, uh, you get a, uh, you get protection, which is the outer limit. I think six to eight months is the outer limit. You sometimes get it. Uh, much quicker than that so that's how it's done okay uh, but the uh, look and feel of the website may change over time uh, mm -hmm. considering the user interface and mm -hmm. other things mm -hmm. so after some changes then you can, the, then you can uh, seek further protection for probably the changed pages uh, or uh, if you're changing the entire website then you can apply for fresh registration okay so we can do this uh, filing online by ourselves or we would need uh, external help? We usually advise that uh, you take external help because uh, sometimes, uh, again, uh, even while filing IP registrations, a lot of people tend to miss out certain things. And then they come back saying that, please change it. Please understand IP registrations, once, once you've applied for a certain registration, it cannot be changed. So whatever you applied for will be granted to you based upon that application. So then if you have to change something or you have to change a category or a product or a service that you wish to incorporate in under that trademark or copyright or whatever it is, uh, you will have to file a fresh application, which is additional, additional uh, uh, expenditure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I have some questions to pay Yes. Hello. Hi. First of all, thank you so much for the great session. Uh, I have some questions regarding patents. Mm -hmm. So one basic question is that what is the procedure to file patents and what is the basic cost involved in that? And secondly, uh, before a patent is granted, it is in a public domain for some time. So the, the mere basis of filing a patent is to protect it from the public. And if it is going into the public domain, is there any chances of that thing of getting copied? And secondly, if there's a paid, uh, if, if there's a patent application on something, but the patent is not granted, can someone else use that, uh, use that or a similar product? So uh, you have three parts to your question. Firstly, uh, how, how, what is the procedure? The procedure is fairly detailed. Uh, I'll just give you a few steps. You write a patent, you uh, do the technical reading of the patent, uh, technical writing, and then eventually you apply for it. Now, uh, when you apply for it, certain objections are raised by the technical staff of the patent uh, registration uh, team at the registry. Mm -hmm. Then you reply to those grounds and everything, and then subsequently, if those grounds are acceptable, then uh, the patent is granted in your favor. Now, uh, this is a basic broader framework otherwise it, it's a fairly detailed procedure it takes a lot of time it's unlike uh, other ip registrations it it usually takes about a year year and a half maybe sometimes a couple of years. Uh, in terms of cost yes the costing is like uh, in fact exponentially higher than uh, 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 any other ip registration it ranges anywhere between uh, uh, 75000 to 125 Go to a, a reputed law firm who only do IP, they'll probably even charge you anywhere upward of 125. So, uh, that is the kind of cost you're looking at in terms of uh, getting a patent protection. However, most law firms tell you right away in the beginning whether this patent can be protected or not, whether it can be re granted registration or not. So, you don't have to spend the entire cost right away. Uh, without really getting that registration, uh, if you feel if the firm feels that it cannot be registered. Now the third part of it, whether uh, if it has been in the public domain and whether it is, and if it is not protected and somebody else uses it, well, uh, again there are two parts. If it is in the public domain right in the beginning and somebody else has not copied it and you apply for it, then it's yours. Simple. If it can be protected, it's yours. Simple. To the other part, yes, if you're not granted protection, 
and the other person is using it then uh, you cannot uh, you can try enforcing your rights but usually it uh, it doesn't really come down to much uh, because you've not been granted protection in that sense so i have a very specific question the product that i'm developing has patents uh, since 1970 all those okay. patents like they are they have been several patents on those kind of products and they have now expired there is okay. one certain patent which was filed in 2011 by an indian mm-hmm. company which has not been granted till now and the company has been shut down and the if you see their patent application it is actually very uh, like very broad and they have tried to cover everything they have basically done a research paper on that and as far as my knowledge that, that that patent will never be granted because of the things that are included in that so my concern is that whether i can uh, like create something similar to that or like whether it will be a problem for me or not are you saying that the patent has expired the earlier patents have expired this mm. recent patent was filed in 2011 by a company and has mm. not been granted till now mm. well the fact is that uh, uh, yes you can use it uh, that is my simple answer however uh, in case it gets granted i don't think it will get granted probably uh, and if it hasn't been granted till now but if it does then they will have a definite uh, infringement right against you in case you are using the same patent uh, without really paying them the royalty or anything okay hello yeah, yeah. i have a question regarding trademarks so yes. Uh, essentially when we are trademarking a com- a brand's name and a logo and a tagline to be precise mm. Mm. hello uh, should be trademark separately sorry i lost your uh, hello. the connection was lost so could you just repeat uh, your question uh, sure sure i'm just saying that when we are trademarking a brand's name logo mm. and a tagline mm. so should that be clubbed into one or should be trademarked as separate application you can uh, uh, do it either way you can uh, use one one application for the entire thing Hello. you can uh, use three applications separately i'll give you a, a very simple example uh, mm-hmm. pepsi mm-hmm. the logo the name pepsi and their caption ye dil mange more all three were registered separately okay Uh, so basically, what are the drawbacks of doing it in a club or a separate? I mean, drawbacks or of- so uh, the advantage of doing it uh, uh, separately is that you can use the caption, just the caption, anywhere you want, and that caption okay. will become associated with your business. And oh, all, same goes for your logo and your name. So that is the advantage. There's no disadvantage, I feel, except for the monetary cost. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Hello, sir. Sir, yes. I have a doubt in contract, sir. Mm-hmm. It is that uh, if at the time of acceptance uh, the party puts uh, the counter offer, do our mm-hmm. offer needs to be reinitiated? So what happens? No, if there's a counter offer, then uh, uh, your your actual uh, then it's your acceptance which is awaited. rather than uh, their acceptance because as i said if uh, you've proposed something and they actually don't accept that and give you a counter offer then is their offer that you have to accept and not the other way around okay sir in the trademark also sir uh, mm-hmm. uh, how do we have to uh, choose the class uh, they have there are many classes in trademark yes so it depends on your product and services that you're offering uh like electronics go under class 9 uh then um, uh, services go uh in classes 36 and beyond so that's how it it works so sir it is better to consult a lawyer to for yes the... definitely definitely okay. because uh, what happens is that uh, people who file applications on their own they just do a generic uh category like heating and cooling devices let's say okay now heating and cooling devices is so generic that you can have anything from a stove to to probably uh, uh, rocket engines so 
so it, it, it what do you want to do under that and then what happens is that the registry has so many objections to your application that it's very difficult to get it passed okay okay so i think anyone else has any questions so that we can just go ahead and conclude the session i think it seems that so if you have any questions uh, we we will share you the email id of nishan sir and we can definitely reach yeah, out to him again sure, sure. and uh, you know proper legal documentation is required for any startup at any stage so thank you so much sir for providing a lot of valuable information today it will definitely you know give us a lot of insight about thank the legal contracts thank thanks a lot for your valuable time as well so thank you everyone thank you sir Thank We you. might reach out to you for any queries. Thanks a lot. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Bye.